Welcome to this webinar hosted by Rails to Trails Conservancy's Trail Nation Collaborative. We are so glad you could join us for this session. My name is Yvonne Wangi, and I'm the Trail Resources and Planning Manager here at RTC. Our mission at RTC is to build a nation connected by trails and reimagine public spaces to create safe ways for everyone to walk, bike, and be active outdoors. Our topic for today is Trails in the Age of Climate Change, where we'll be focusing on disaster recovery following severe damage from extreme events. It's my pleasure to introduce our panelists. Joshua Bell comes to us from Philadelphia Parks and Recreation, where he works as the operations manager. And in his role, he responds to multiple weather-related emergencies by estimating damages, gathering and maintaining data for the operations unit, liaising with the Office of, Oper of Emergency Management and interfacing with FEMA teams during the reimbursement process. Today, Joshua will walk us through the recovery process for trails in Philadelphia after Hurricane Ida. Eric Williams is the Natural Resources Planner for the Papio Missouri Ri River Natural Resources District, where he's been for over 10 years. And he's been working to conserve and protect natural resources for nearly two decades. His work focuses on the planning, design, and construction of trail projects, and he'll be sharing the story of the damage and rebuilding of the Lead Platte River Bridge in the winter of 2019. Missy Van Landit and Andrew Hefley come to us from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Missy is the Recreation Partnerships Chief with a Park, with a park and Recreation Management Program, where she's been for over 13 years working with partners, friends, friends groups, coordinating marketing, communications, and outreach for the program, and overseeing property capital development projects. And Andrew is the superintendent of the Wildcat Mountain Work, Wildcat Mountain Work Unit and the Wisconsin DNR Bureau of Parks and Recreation, where he's been since 2016. The unit consists of four state parks and three state trails, including the Elvoy Sparta State Trail, which is the subject of this presentation. Now, before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to set the stage. Why should we as trail managers, advocates, and practitioners reckon with the subject of climate change? Well, because climate change is contributing to more intense and extreme weather events that can, that can cause expensive and dangerous damage to trails, as we'll see in our presentations. Because climate change has a role to play in making spaces more resilient. Um, these trails become, sorry, because trails have a role to play in making spaces more resilient, including acting as green corridors that can help mitigate against urban heat, help with stormwater management, and provide valuable access to the outdoors. Because the environment and climate-related vulnerabilities will also affect where we site, plan, design, construct, and manage our trails, including the costs of all these steps. In other words, trails must be planned and designed to be more resilient in response to these issues. Because there are funding opportunities related to climate change mitigation and increasing resilience. For example, the PROTECT program is a new competitive grant program that provides $1.4 billion in funding over four years, designed to make transportation more resilient to sea rising sea levels, increased flooding, natural disasters, and climate change. And because trails are economic engines and they contribute to the community, health, equity, and vitality. At Rails to Trails, we want to see a nation connected by trails. But as we continue to invest in trails as fundamental infrastructure, rather than just nice to have, it'll become more urgent to think about how we're building those trails and how those trails can be part of the resilience of the places that they're in. Um, here are some helpful resources on the topic if you're interested in exploring further. First, our online trail building toolbox has a page discussing trails and climate resilience. And then FHWA also released a report on trails as resilient infrastructure. And last month they had a webinar on it, which I highly recommend that you view. FHWA also produced a white paper focusing on the roles of trails in climate resilience and emergency response. We'll also be dropping additional resources in the chat so you can dive into that at your own time. 
Now, while trails can be affected by diverse types of climate impacts, including storms, flooding, fires, heat, today's case studies will all involve in some way storms and flooding. Flooding is a major concern for trail managers. In fact, about 38% of attendees at that FHWA webinar that I mentioned ranked it as their top concern. And trails across geographies and across landscapes are at risk. The presentations that you're about to hear will outline the circumstances that led to the flooding, the extent of the damage, and the steps that they took that they took to recover and to restore their trails. And with that, I'll hand it off to Joshua Bell. Joshua, you can take it away. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, yeah, as Yvonne mentioned, my name is Joshua Bell. I work for Philadelphia Parks and Recreation, um, and I'm in the operations division. And um, so I want to just give a little bit of context. Um, so we're located in the Northeast, as most of you probably know. Um, Philadelphia's uh, borders on New Jersey, uh, Delaware, and New York, pretty much New York. Um, so uh, in this context, we have three trails I'm really going to talk about. Um, there's actually a fourth one that I'll also talk about, but um, for this purpose, mainly the three, you have the Schuylkill River Trail, is outlined on the number one is East and West Fairmount Park is the main piece in Philadelphia. Um, and then you have the Manioc Canal Trail uh, in the northwest of that. And then number three is the Wissahickon um, Forbidden Trail. And so just some um, uses along the trail and on the uh, right side of the screen, you have um, the East and West Fairmount Park, which is the the main piece of the Schuylkill River Trail, um, and also the main one during Hurricane Ida that uh, took the brunt of the damage. Um, and as you can see here, um, the, the the Schuylkill River Trail will ultimately cover 120 miles. Um, that will be that stretch, you know, all across um, multiple municipalities. Um, but what I'm talking about today uh, is 16.2 miles or so within Philadelphia, and it allows access to bicycling. You have rollerblading. There's two skate parks, um, running, walking, boating. So there's a whole myriad of different um, accesses to different types of um, trail activities. So first I want to talk, before we get into um, Hurricane Ida, I want to talk about past major storm impacts. And this list is not exhaustive. It is just the time that I've been at Parks and Recreation since 2014. So it's a fairly short amount of time, nine years um, going on 10. Uh, but we have a severe thunderstorm of 2015. Um, and during that, we had straight line winds of 72 mile an hour winds, um, which is the fourth highest wind gust that we've had in the region. And it took down over 800 trees. And right now I don't have a good estimate next to that because I was not really involved at that time in 2015 in estimation. It wasn't until um, that next year that I really got more heavily into it and kind of thrust myself into that uh, role. So in 2016, January of 2016, we had Snowstorm Jonas, uh, which was an emergency uh, FEMA event. So um, we had estimations estimation as a city, $6.9 million in damages. Uh, well, not necessarily damages, more um, FEMA reimbursement money. Um, and most of that uh, included uh, overtime and force account, which I'll go into a little earlier or, or a little later. But the overtime with that, it was 22.4 inches of snow within an eight to 12 hour time period. It came through fairly quickly because it warmed up within, you know, four to four or five days after we saw the majority of it melting. Um, but you can see that uh, in just a short amount of time, that 22.4 inches in the city of Philadelphia caused a lot of uh, overtime and, and costs, expenses related to that. Um, and then with the derecho event in 2020, it was, it almost hit $1 million. Now that is just damages to parks and recreation property um, and trails not to the city at large. 
Um, but that derecho event was only a 30 minute storm with 60 to 80 mile an hour wind gusts, sometimes sustained, brought down 521 trees. And then we go to only two months later. So obviously within a uh, two month period, 521 trees do not get cleaned up. Um, we have storm Isaias. Uh, and during that time uh, in 2020, it cost us about $2.8 million. Um, and it, the storm brought 24 hours worth of rain at just over four inches of rain. So within 24 hours, we had four inches of rain in the area. Um, and this total cost does not include private, residential, and commercial damage, which far exceeds that number. And then um, just here, there's all, oh, sorry. There's a few pictures, um, the derecho event on the right side that snapped, my picture may be in the way, but snapped a tree right in half. Um, we have Storm Isaias, that's Roosevelt Boulevard, if anyone knows Roosevelt Boulevard, completely underwater there. Um, and then, um, so we get into Hurricane Ida in 2021. So just to give you an idea of the timeline of events, that's one year after our major uh, storm, Isaias. Um, so we're still not, you know, a year later, we're still not 100% complete, to, you know, getting all of those trees uh, taken care of. But we have five to 10 inches of rain that fell within about a six hour period. And there were seven tornadoes that had touched down in the area between New Jersey and PA. Um, and there were major uh, affected areas along the Schuylkill River, especially. Um, and the Schuylkill River crested at 16.35 feet. So here on the right side, you have the Manioc Canal Trail. Um, and this is part of the Schuylkill River Trail, but in Philadelphia, we have another name for it because it follows the Maniunk Canal. So you can see where the Schuylkill River splits and you have the Maniunk Canal. Um, and that tends to flood quite often, um, but at 16.35 feet, which is a near record high, the record high was in 1869 at 17 feet. So we almost hit the record high. Uh, so you can imagine it did a lot of damage. And the photo on the bottom shows just how um, intense that was. Um, the middle part between the two, um, the between the sets of houses there, that's the canal itself um, with Main Street on the other side of that. So um, Hurricane Ida's impacts, we had 32 PPR locations that were affected, Parks and Recreation, Philadelphia Parks and Recreation locations that were affected. Um, what happened was, is uh, on 9-1, um, we were given about six days to put together a high-level estimate, and this initial estimate was at $20 million, and this was a very high-level estimate, of course, because there's not much time to do this, and uh, at the bottom is an example of the spreadsheet that I started, where we just simply tr started tracking costs between a few of us of what we thought might be the effects. So in the yellow, you see the 15 million for the Schuylkill River wall. That was something that needed to be assessed later. It was just a, an approximation of what the damage could be from the storm slamming the sides of the river wall. Um, and then after 9-7, we adjusted the cost by 10-15. So we only had about a month to adjust that cost down and that $15 million we realized would not qualify for FEMA funding because it, uh, we couldn't prove that that damage happened during that storm and wasn't something that was already there. Um, and then we have a, a, reimbur a reimbursable amount. It took about a year before we have that adjusted cost of $5 million. Reimbursable at the time of me putting together these numbers was about $1 million. So you see, it's only about a fifth of what actual damages we incurred and had to pay for to get back to a normal operation. And now during, I'll just speed through these a little bit, but here's some of the damages through for Hurricane Ida. So if anybody knows about the waterworks, which is down by the Art Museum in Philadelphia, you could see at the top of the 
the photo there, you have, you can just see the tops of those windows peeking through. That's how high that water was. Those windows are about, uh, I'd say about 10 to 12 feet high, maybe a little less. Um, so you have a large portion of this. And now this picture was taken when the water had already receded. And then you have the waterworks interior on the right that that entire basement was flooded and destroyed all of the mechanical panels of uh, our elevator. Those are very costly repairs, something about like at 1.8 million or so. Um, and then you have Markward Playground. Again, this is a picture off the street where the water has receded. It was much higher than that. And we have the playground building, which had to have mold remediation and a bunch of other uh, equipment removed. And then you have the Wissahickon Creek Trail, which is that third trail that I was talking about on the top uh, pictures. You have mass amounts of uh, washout of trails and um, many, many, uh, a lot of debris that had to be cleaned up. Um, the the bottom panel of pictures is a uh, Manioc Canal Trail. So you see trees falling across the trail, a, a ton of silt debris that had to be cleaned up. That was also along the Schuylkill River Trail. So a little bit about debris management. We had 860 cubic yards of silt and vegetative debris. It's about 1,200 tons. Um, and we have an organic recycling center where we can process a lot. There is a limit to that, of course. Um, we didn't quite exceed that limit, uh, but we do have still a, quite a stockpile of silt and other debris. We process that into mulch, into uh, fill, into um, different other you know, compostable materials uh, for the citizens of Philadelphia to use. Um, and we replaced about 855 tons of stone. Um, so, yeah, we replaced 100, 855 tons of stone. Uh, it took seven days to get the Wissahickon Trail back to a usable, safe state. It took one month uh, and a week about to get three miles of the Manioc Trail from completely close to usable. And it took 10 days to get the Schuylkill River Trail back up and running. Most of that is paved, so there, there wasn't as much washout, it's was more cleaning. Three days to get the Grace Ferry Crescent Trail, two days for MLK Drive, and five days for Pennypack Creek Trail in the Northeast. And um, yeah, I think some of the lessons that we learned prior to Ida is we learned that it's good to keep good records. We need to fold in fringe benefits to our calculations, and we need to needed to expand the cost of our, or expand our cost tracking sheet to include more than just the basic costs that we had been tracking, which was our force account. So if we only knew, of course, during this FEMA process, if we only had a full understanding of those labor types, it would have been really important because we worked already in the past with Storm Jonas to get the force account, which was our own labor, but we did not have any experience on donated resources and we didn't have any experience with contract resources. So with donated resources, we uh, estimated about $100,000 worth of, of work happened from donated uh, with you know friends groups and things like that cleaning up efforts. And we couldn't get any of that money back because we didn't understand the appropriate you know worker logs that had to be created, uh, receipts that had to be kept. And then co contracted, we had that public-private partnership one of them was the Temple uh, temple Boathouse's docks that got ripped right away and sent downstream. Uh, temple could get those back up and running within a month or two, but we didn't know at the time that we, when we were hoping to reimburse them for that, because that is a city asset, uh, we didn't know that, hey, you need to make sure they follow all the procedures of the city in order for us to be able to get that reimbursed to us from FEMA. And so the safety cable in the Schuylkill River Trail, or um, in the Schuylkill River, was uh, constructed back in the 70s, where uh, the idea was that as you were boating upstream, you could grab onto these tendrils, and it was sort of your last 
ditch effort to, if you're capsized or something, to not go over the falls where that water works I showed you earlier was. So PPR, we removed the old broken cable in January of 22. So it took us four months to remove that. As we all know, government can move slowly. That's very quick for us. We got an emergency work order, $20,000 to remove that old cable so it wouldn't get caught on anything and do more damage. It took us 1.5 years to replace the safety cable in a bid process. So it was an emergency work order that was handled by the streets department. So we had this sort of partnership with streets and it was $268,000. So I think some keys to successful partnership is we, we, we keep the lines of communication open between the departments. We wanna be flexible. We wanna make sure that we are uh, being responsive. We're, we're attending meetings and really lean on the expertise. Their expertise is in engineering and that's what we were able to do is lean on them for their expertise. And the really the last piece of that uh, is the FEMA process, learn. It's complex. Learn, 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 learn. Um, and then a little bit of thoughts on resiliency uh, before I fully conclude. Um, but I feel like it's very hard for governments to really focus on resiliency um, because we're really, we're much better at responding in the moment to emergencies than preparing those mitigation strategies. And part of that has to do with funding, of course, is that you need a lot of funding to be able to do a lot of these projects. Um, and then the question really for me is, how can we move that needle to focus better on creating resiliency? So we really need to think about that and how that how we move forward. Um, one of such projects is the HESCO barriers in the Eastwick Regional Community. And earlier I had talked about, you know, that's along the Cobbs Creek. It's not part of the Schuylkill River Trail. Um, it's a little more south of that, but this community is, and you'll see on the left side, this community gets flooded very often. And there was a lot of property damage during Hurricane Ida and previous Isaias. Um, the green uh, line there is the HESCO barrier line. So in the upper right-hand corner are those barriers that can be deployed. They're supposed to be deployed for a short period of time. This is a project coming down the pipeline that would allow for us to protect that community um, and then we're, we're currently doing a ton of studies on how that'll affect downstream. Um, but the Office of Sustainability, and I have a link in there for their um, office, they have a flood risk management task force team, which really protects communities from flood risk. They advance the climate adaptation. They ensure smart infrastructure and land use decisions and build collaboration among city agencies around flood, flood risk management. So they're really the ones that are the driving force toward resiliency, less so me and my division. But I want to thank you for, for listening to, to my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. Next, we're going to hear from Eric. Eric, take it away. Yep. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Eric Williams. I'm located in Omaha, Nebraska. I work for the Papio Missouri River Natural Resources District, um, and this will highlight the damages that occurred in the flood in 2019 along the Platte River to the uh, lead bridge, the main structure over the Platte River, and the Mopac Trail, which was adjacent to the river in that location. So a little bit of history about the Natural Resource District structure in Nebraska. Um, this is unique to Nebraska. The idea is that the state is broken down into NRD territories that are based not on kind of arbitrary straight lines like the rest of the uh, states in the Midwest uh, in Great Plains here, um, but along the, uh, the locations where resources can be found. So the state is divided into uh, watersheds functionally. Um, this happened after a series of flooding events in the 60s. Um, and a desire to streamline the efficiency of our governments um, that were managing soil, water, and other natural resources. Uh, our name is long and complicated because it's a combination of two previous NRDs, the Papio and the Middle Missouri Tributaries NRD. So um, that's why we have such a uh, long, complicated government name, but we like to use abbreviations, generally uh, referred to as the NRD in our territory. 
Uh, there's a map that shows the NRDs across the state of Nebraska. You can see the Papio Missouri River on the very eastern portion. Um, while we are a small portion of the state of Nebraska, the population density in the Omaha area means that we have a significantly higher number of residents and the associated property tax valuation, which funds the NRDs across the state, does mean that we have a significantly higher budget than most of the rest of the NRDs across Nebraska. Functionally, it's Omaha and then the area around Lincoln, the Lower Platte South NRD, and then the other entities across the rest of the state that have much larger area, a lot more resources to focus on, but a lot fewer people. Um, in the Omaha area, this is the trails map uh, that reflects the work that the NRD has done over the last few decades. Uh, in the 80s, someone suggested that we could build trails on top of the maintenance access along our creek network. Um, and we'll see how that goes, was the thought, and uh, jump forward a few decades, uh, it was very popular. So we now have over 140 miles of trails following generally from the upper left portion of the map down to the lower right portion of the map, flowing from the northwest to the southeast along the Papio Creek watershed. This has been a collaboration between the NRD and all of the cities in the area, the city of Omaha, which is located in Douglas County, and then the five cities across the Sarpy County area, which is blue, the bottom half of the map. What we'll talk about today is the little insert, which is kind of the lower left portion of this map, kind of all the way down at the bottom of our territory along the Platte River. Um, Omaha and the metro area uh, is bounded by the Missouri River uh, on the right side. Um, the right half of the map is actually the state of Iowa, but Missouri River on the eastern edge of Nebraska, and then the Platte River, which comes south and turns and heads east down to the confluence with the Missouri. The flooding event actually included uh, major damage along uh, the Missouri River, the Elkhorn River and the Platte River, but we'll focus on um, just the Platte River for today. So this is a map that shows the entire Platte River watershed. And again, you can see Omaha down there at the very bottom, the confluence of the Platte and the Missouri. So there's a very large area upstream. And this was a climate change caused event because there was a rapid warming over the course of several days up above freezing. And so the existing snowpack began to melt across most of the Platte and Missouri um, upper, uh, upper Basin Territory. And that was coupled with several inches of rain, a, um, an unusual rain event. It might have otherwise been snow, except the temperature was so high. So the melt of the snow coupled with the rain and the rain causing additional melt led to a significant amount of water coming down the Missouri River, the Elkhorn River and the Platte River simultaneously. And so all three experienced really historic flooding not in the um, exclusively kind of summer thunderstorm type of flooding that you often think about, but a new kind of event, a winter uh, meltdown flood um, that occurred on all three rivers. So that occurred in March of 2019. And uh, this is an aerial photo of the Lead Bridge, which is a former railroad bridge that was converted to a uh, pedestrian trail in, the, um, in about 2001. Uh, and you can see that the water was all the way up to the bottom side of the structure. Um, the photo on the right highlights that uh, the water was actually cresting over, and you can see it, um, the wet concrete on the top, the water was cresting over the top of the bridge. Uh, that's not how the bridge was designed. And so debris coming down the Platte River slammed into the structure on the upstream side and caused damage to the railing, to the bridge um, itself, to the substructure, and to the trail, which is on the far side uh, of the photo on the right. Um, so the trail was submerged as well. Uh, it's a chip limestone trail, and so um, chip limestone trails do not do well underwater, and they're ended up with a, a lot of sediment on top of the trail surface. So here's some photos of the damage that occurred. Uh, again, the, the trail was submerged under between 18 and 24 inches of silt and sand and sediments. Um, the Platte River Basin uh, runs through the sand hills in Nebraska. Most of Nebraska has quite um, loose sandy soils, and so a lot of that got picked up by the river and transported down during the events. As the water receded, it left uh, a couple feet of sediment. Uh, again, you can see the uh, damage to the structure itself from the debris that was also coming down uh, the Platte River during the events. Um, it knocked over the fence for a few hundred feet, the railing on, on the top of the uh, trail deck, and it also damaged the icebreaker noses, which were on the upstream side of the bridge. And so that structural work needed to be, uh, needed to be repaired as well. The first phase was to remove the debris because you can't do any of the other uh, restoration work unless you get that debris off of there. Um, so a large excavator came out and uh, picked, up the, uh, picked up the debris from the upstream side, uh, loaded it into trucks. Um, this was again, a former railroad bridge. So uh, it is load rated for um, heavy duty equipment. 
Um, so load the uh, debris into the truck, haul it away, and you can see in the lower right some of the trunks that were harvested and were going to be repurposed, I think, for making pallets. But the debris was large enough that it needed to be um, physically lifted out of the water um, from the top side rather than down in the water. That meant that we did not have any permitting constraints uh, because we were not actually impacting anything in the water. Lift it up with the arm, bring it over, and drop it in the truck. Uh, and that, that process worked really well. Uh, next, we did some structural repair on the substructure of the bridge. So the photo on the left, you can see those icebreaker nose structures. Um, that's a little bit of an older design, so it's a little um, flatter slope, 45 degrees. Uh, the idea is that ice coming down the river will lift, and once it gets up out of the water, the weight of the ice will break the sheets in half. Um, but in this event, the debris was coming down fast enough and with enough force with that water that it sheared off one of the um, icebreaker noses entirely and dislodged a few of them. So you can see the middle photo is a uh, repouring of a newer, flatter uh, icebreaker nose on um, one of the piers. And then the right photo shows the new steel banding that reattached the uh, icebreakers to the piers. Uh, and that was uh, determined to be the best way rather than removing and replacing them, um, just reattach them with some additional steel banding into the existing concrete of the pier and the icebreaker itself. Uh, so that was the second phase, was to, to restabilize the structure of the bridge. And the third phase was to repair the railing on top of the bridge to keep the users of the trail safe. Um, so you can see that uh, we had to remove the existing railing, and you can see the little brackets on the bottom. Those brackets from the center photo uh, were initially placed into the concrete deck when it was poured. And so um, that means they were not a user serviceable part. So uh, once the railing was sheared off during the event, um, we had to re-drill and uh, replace uh, new mounting structures. So there was some fabrication work to get those new brackets installed. Um, we attempted to, re um, to reuse as much of the equipment as possible to help uh, reduce cost. So you can see in the third photo on the right that some of the wood looks older. That was the original railing structure. Some of the wood is new and needed to be replaced because it was damaged by that debris coming over the top of the, uh, of the structure of the bridge. And then you can see some of the new um, brackets mounting into the concrete deck of the bridge. The last project was to restore the trail. Uh, this is what the trail looked like before. Uh, you can see that it's a chip limestone trail. It's very popular. Uh, there's an event that travels between Omaha and Lincoln called the Market to Market Relay. Um, and it runs down this section of the trail. Uh, and it is close to the Platte River. The idea here being that this is within the floodplain. You can't have other types of development. So we can use it for recreation, active transportation, and access to natural resources. Uh, it's been great for the last 20 years. Um, except that, next slide, uh, during, the, uh, during the flood, again, the entire trail was submerged. On the left, you can see some of the water uh, not yet receded and big piles um, of uh, functionally sand dunes that were dropped on top of the trail. You can see that distinctive wavy pattern from where the water was flowing across the top. Uh, so we decided that the best course was to abandon the existing location of the trail down right next to the bank of the river, uh, kind of smooth out some of the sand that we could, uh, but move over um, maybe 50 or 100 feet away from the bank of the river and establish a new alignment of the trail. So that's what you can see in the photo on the right is um, grading out. Uh, yep, the grading out the new alignment of the trail between the trees. We attempted to not remove any additional trees other than what was damaged during the storm. And then you can see that the uh, new trail alignment uh, established the subgrade, um, recompact, um, and then replace the chip limestone on the top on the uh, next slide. Yeah, you can see uh, the new trail alignment. So restore the same soft surface trail type that was there before. Uh, most of the trails in the Omaha Metro are a more firm concrete surface. So this is a different surface type and people in the area really enjoy running on this. It's a little softer on your knees. Um, so that's why the relay event is so popular, um, but establish a new trail location um, to, uh, to uh, help to protect against the risk of additional flooding in the future. While we had never seen an event like this in the previous 20 years, it seems more likely that increased temperature will cause increased risk of this type of event again in the future. So this project was designed to um, reduce the risk of potential significant damage in future events. Uh, and, uh, and we hope that uh, even if the water does make it out of the banks again, that this new alignment will be less susceptible to damage than what we experienced in 2019.
There was a giant celebration when the bridge was converted originally in 2001. And so people who uh, had been there originally were very excited two decades later to come back and celebrate with a ribbon cutting of a reopening of the lead bridge across the river. Uh, it's about uh, 1,600 feet long. Uh, it's right down um, pretty close to the water, which is usually a benefit. But when the river comes up, it's uh, then it's a liability. Um, so people really like this structure. Um, uh, and everybody was really excited to see this uh, reestablished. This is part of a broader trail system that goes from Omaha to Lincoln along the former Missouri Pacific or Mopac rail corridor. Uh, so reestablishing this connection was uh, very much appreciated by residents on both sides of the river, again, in the two major population centers in Nebraska. After the projects, the four projects were completed. Um, the, the next effort is to now continue the connection. And you can see at the top, the Platte River and the Mopac Trail in green. Um, the idea is now to continue the connection through this little dotted red line area uh, down to another portion of the former rail corridor where the Mopac Trail continues to Lincoln. It's about 15 miles on the north and east side in uh, Sarpy County toward Omaha. It's about 26 miles on the south and west side toward Lincoln, and there's about an eight mile gap. And there has been funding dedicated um, based largely on the success of the, uh, of the project and the restoration uh, after the flooding. Uh, the funding is now available to close that gap. Uh, so we're looking forward to um, the people on uh, the south side of the river moving that project forward. Uh, in order to prepare for um, future events, like I said, we uh, realigned the trail and uh, restored the protective structures on the bridge. Um, we hope that this will help prepare uh, and, and protect against the risk, the elevated risk that uh, is anticipated in the future. Uh, we know that nothing can protect against all of the risks, but we hope that uh, future events will have uh, less potential for damage uh, based on the restoration work that we've uh, undertaken so far. And so uh, you can't have a trail presentation without a trail ribbon cutting selfie. Um, so we really enjoyed uh, the celebration after the four projects were completed. It's been very popular. The market to market relay event is running between Omaha and Lincoln again every year. Uh, and people are very glad for this connection because there is literally no other way to make it across the Platte River without this particular active transportation connection. Um, so um, we're glad to have people have that access again and um, looking forward to uh, many more uh, happy years and happy miles along the trail system. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, appreciate you being here to hear about uh, the restoration work that occurred. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, I'll invite Andrew to lead us into our last presentation. Yeah, thanks, Yvonne. And, and <clears throat> thanks to uh, RTC for the invitation to uh, give this presentation. And so, um, my, again, my name is Andrew Hefley. I'm the superintendent out of Wildcat Mountain State Park. Um, and, and my work unit consists of several state parks and trail properties um, that I supervise. And joining me today is uh, Missy. I'll let her uh, just give a quick introduction uh, of herself. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Missy Van Landen, and I'm the Recreation Partnership Section Chief, and I oversee capital development and external relations for the program and get to work with Andy on fun projects like this. All right. Thanks, Missy. And and so just by way of introduction, we're going to discuss uh, uh, assessment repair the historic, after historic flooding on the Elroy Sparta State Trail um, that occurred in 2018. Um, and so next slide, please. Um, just by way of introduction of the trail itself um, and its location, uh, on the left of this picture, you can see the, the outline of the state of Wisconsin um, and that area highlighted kind of in west central Wisconsin is where we're located. Um, and then you can see there there's um, several trails connected from right to left where the Elroy Sparta State Trail is the second trail there. Uh, the Elroy Sparta State Trail is a multi-use trail. Um, it's uh, available for uh, bicycling, uh, hiking, cross-country skiing, snowshoeing. Uh, we do have two uh, uh, campgrounds that we operate on the trail as well. And in the wintertime with enough snow conditions, uh, it's open for uh, snowmobiling as well. Uh, just a few uh, facts about the Elroy Sparta State Trail. Um, you may or may not know it's uh, considered the first rails to trails project in the in the United States. Um, it's a 32 mile long trail that um, travels through. Uh, it's uh, bookended by the cities of Sparta and Elroy uh, on either end and, and three other rural communities that the trail passes through. It's now part of a network of four uh, connected state trails uh, in that west central region of Wisconsin um, that uh, uh, 
traverses over 100 miles of trail, uh, all former railroad corridors. Uh, the railroad uh, for this particular location was originally built in uh, the mid 1870s and converted, uh, purchased by the state and converted to a trail in 1965 after uh, the railroad uh, stopped using it. Uh, there are uh, the main attraction of the trail of the three tunnels. Uh, we're in a part of the state known as the Driftless area uh, with uh, pretty significant hilly uh, hills and valleys in the area. Um, and so to make uh, uh, train traffic easier uh, through the area, they cr created three tunnels um, on the trail. And those are just uh, magnificent structures that we have on the tunnel. Um, the trail is used by uh, over 60,000 visitors uh, a year um, in this rural part of the state, um, so it's a great uh, uh, tourism and economic driver in the area. Um, again, it's a multi-use trail uh, with varying uses. So a little bit about some of our general natural disaster statistics. Um, we've had eight declared disasters since 2013 in the state of Wisconsin. Some of the, there's been more than that, some of which are just on um, private lands or other municipal lands, but we've had eight within the Department of Natural Resources on properties that we own which would exceed about $11 million in estimated damage over the course of those events. Many of those events actually occurred concurringly in June on the same day, multiple years in a row, which was very interesting. So for a while there, we were very afraid of the month of June, but we've had a little reprieve for a couple of years. Some of these are generally, um, they're generally rain event declarations. We've had 68 individual projects on 58 properties. You can go to the next slide. We generally see um, a lot more volatility. So this is just an overview of what we're generally seeing in Wisconsin. We're seeing much more extremes. I'm sure you are across the country as well. We don't really know what we're gonna get. For example, in Wisconsin today, um, they're getting about a foot of snow in Northern Wisconsin, and we're getting a few inches of rain in Southern Wisconsin. So we're seeing more extremes more often. We're also seeing a lot more smaller events that don't meet the declaration thresholds for FEMA or emergency management. So we're seeing more ice events, more wind events, more flooding and rain events, but due to the thresholds uh, based on your population, we're not able to actually realize those as reimbursable events. We're actually seeing um, more dry fire events as well. Can you go back to that last slide just for one more thing? Um, for Wisconsin, I'm sure this has something to do with the Mississippi River, but the Mississippi River can help to generate its own weather. And so in Wisconsin, um, as these weather systems pass from west to east, we actually see most of our disaster events along the western side of the state. Um, and most of these have to do generally with flooding and with water control and travel infrastructure, so trails. You can go to the next slide. Um, some of the federal disaster trends that we're seeing, um, we're seeing um, overall across the United States, um, really since about 2019, 2018, we're seeing, like I said, a lot less events in Wisconsin and more events in the coastal areas of the United States. Some of that has to do primarily with population. Wisconsin has a lower population and therefore doesn't meet those minimum thresholds. So where in years past, we may have seen more of those disaster events declared, we're seeing less and less and more taking place in the coastal United States. Um, despite the fact that our FEMA staff um, across the United States are very good to work with and try to be very helpful, um, some of the things that we're seeing are it's definitely more of a Band-Aid approach to repairing natural disasters. So in Wisconsin in particular, we're having difficulty with improved projects, hazard mitigation, long timelines, and getting approvals. And so what this means is that if we have a culvert, let's say it was a 48 inch culvert and that culvert needs to be replaced, FEMA is paying for a 48 inch culvert to be put back in. But what we're seeing with climate change is we're seeing more precipitation, more volatility, and the amount of water that's moving um, per feet or per second um, is increasing significantly due to climate change and our infrastructure can't keep up with it. Next slide. And moving over to Andy. Thanks, Missy. Um, so yeah, dialing in on on this specific event in in 2018 in August uh, in August and September of 2018, uh, much of southern Wisconsin uh, was affected by uh, heavy rains and and significant storm events. Uh, there was uh, rains, uh, severe storms, tornadoes, straight line winds, um, and as you can see in the in the picture on the right there, uh, those 
uh, highlighted counties were all counties that were um, included in the uh, disaster declaration at that time. Then um, that was uh, uh, issued by by the president uh, then in uh, mid October of that year. Um, through that uh, disaster declaration, thirty thirty seven point two million uh, uh, was dispersed in in public assistance. Uh, public assistance grants and 13 and a half million in individual assistance grants. And so you can see the the uh, significant impact to uh, public infrastructure, trails, um, roads, things like that in the area. Um, here uh, you can see that the trail lies in the area that received the most rainfall in this storm event. This is a um, kind of a, a radar capture of uh, uh, rainfall totals from uh, that about a day, day and a half uh, storm event. Um, and in that picture, you can see the the black line there um, is the Elroy Sparta Trail or approximately the Elroy Sparta Trail. And that lies right in the uh, area that receives some of the heaviest rains. Uh, most of the trail um, along its entire length received between four and, and 15 inches of rain, which uh, just is an unbelievable amount. Uh, having lived through it, um, it's still kind of unbelievable to look back on and, and uh, to realize what we dealt with then. Next slide. Uh, some of the impacts of the 2018 flood, um, we had over 22 miles of the trail damaged, most significantly between the village of Norwalk and the city of Elroy. Um, so kind of that uh, eastern, more two-thirds of the trail. Um, some of the damages included, and I'll have some photos coming up uh, of some of these, um, but damage included three trail washouts, uh, four slope failures or landslide areas, uh, major bridge and culvert washouts and damages to those structures, um, and then our, our biggest uh, repair project um, had a almost $2 million uh, price tag associated with it. Uh, so just uh, some photos showing some of the examples of the damages here uh, in the kind of upper right corner of the photo. You can see that is the trail there um, and you can see a significant slope failure there. This is a, a drone photo from the engineering firm that was hired to do our inspect or uh, assessments. Um, and so uh, we've got a few more pictures of other examples. Uh, next slide. Here you can see uh, this is one of the most significant washouts of the trail itself that occurred. Um, that's the Kickapoo River, um, which uh, which its bank is not supposed to be the trail. <laughs> next slide. Uh, here you can see this is probably our worst damaged bridge. Um, the high water level, I mean, the, the water really overtopped this uh, bridge um, and cause significant damage to that abutment. And here's a, a, an example. Uh, uh, some of the other presenters have referred to some of the debris that's been left on, on the trail. I affectionately call it flood mud. Um, it is uh, not a fun material to work with, but uh, you know, we had many, many areas of the trail that because of the topography of the area um, and the trail being kind of a low spot in some places uh, wound up with um, in some cases like this photo shows about four feet of debris uh, left uh, standing on top of the trail. So what was our flood response? Immediately we went out and um, kind of did some rapid assessments right away. Of course, uh, primary focus and concern is, is uh, uh, safety and health of, of the communities that the trail is involved with, people that may uh, use the trail. And so uh, we knew right away that that the trail had to be closed to all uses. There's no way that um, we could continue to allow people, even as curious as they are, to go out on the trail just because of safety concerns. Uh, here you can see me uh, uh, in the photo here, just uh, kind of flabbergasted at the amount of damages that we saw out there. So uh, park staff, myself, other park staff and the engineering folks uh, within the DNR went out and kind of did a rapid assessment. And part of that was to kind of try and start doing some cost estimates for our damages to help uh, emergency management um, and the governor's office uh, decide on, on whether or not we met the thresholds for a, a disaster declaration. Uh, so re recovering from the flood, well, it was a long process, um, but uh, we quickly made some repairs to some of the least damaged sections and were able to open a few miles of trail. Of course, trails are are Im important to the local communities, uh, whether it be economically, socially, um, you know, tourism dollars. Um, and so we were able to open quickly a few sections, uh, but there was, again, that 22 mile section that had significant damage that took uh, quite a bit longer just because of the the amount of damage, uh, the engineering involved, as well as the funding that needed to be um, secured. Uh, we created uh, a project proposal for the larger, more expensive repairs. 
Uh, and then uh, KL Engineering, a private firm, was um, hired by the state to conduct in-depth inspections and complete pre-design and, and develop the scope for the, the final design of our big project. Uh, flooding recovery continued. Uh, project design and cost estimates were completed. Um, again, KL Engineering was great to work with, and they came out and, and did inspections of, of many of our structures, as well as trail surface and, and the landslides, um, and developed um, alternatives for repairs for that. Uh, the project was presented to the Wisconsin State Building Commission for funding approval, and then it was sent out for bids. Unfortunately, we uh, did experience significant delay because of uh, the fact that the bids came back higher than what we had uh, funding approved for at the time. Uh, and then, uh, so then the project was brought back to the building commission for additional funding. Thankfully that was granted and the contract was awarded. And the, the work on this, uh, the major repairs uh, began in December of 2020. So that's uh, more than two years removed from the event itself. Um, and then the project was uh, completed in December of 2021. And I'll let Missy just describe some of the uh, the funding challenges and, and sources for these. Sure. So in Wisconsin, um, the, the biggest part is the determination phase. And what we're seeing is that, again, in Wisconsin, it's much more difficult for um, us to get funding here because we have less population and it takes a lot more damage for us to be able to get that declaration. Um, the other thing that we're seeing is that some of the thresholds for direct pay versus reimbursables are continuing to go up and we're having difficulty meeting some of those minimum thresholds and they're always changing. Um, the other thing that we see in Wisconsin, which may be like some of the other states, is that we work through our Department of Administration to execute projects. And if you can imagine kind of being as the DNR, we're the in-between agency between FEMA, Wisconsin Emergency Management, and the Department of Administration. And neither one fully understands each other's processes. And so things can take a really long time um, in order to get the right estimates, get the right information to FEMA. Um, and, and again, we're still dealing with projects that are actively out to bid and under construction from even 2015, 2016. So there's often a very large discrepancy between the work the cost estimates and the timeline when we try to execute projects. So it can be very challenging um, working with multiple different agencies across state and federal government to get these projects completed. Uh, thanks, Missy. And just as we wrap up, I've got a few before and after photos and, and then looking towards uh, resiliency for future events. This photo here, uh, um, uh, before... And when I say before, it's uh, before repairs. So it would be after the flood, but before our repairs. So this is uh, the same location, uh, that bridge with wooden pier structures, uh, old and in difficult um, condition after the flood, uh, replaced with a clear span um, steel structured bridge. Uh, it, Missy referred to a kind of the Band-Aid approach where where uh, FEMA replaces in kind. Um, in some instances, uh, this is a great example where we as a as an agency and a program, uh, and so I'm thankful for our program leadership and and agency leadership that allowed us to go and be uh, go above and beyond. We decided uh, we needed to make this uh, repair and not replace it just in kind, but make the improvements that were necessary. So we um, kind of took on the funding uh, required for those additional improvements. Next slide, please. Uh, here's just another before and after that that photo on the left with uh, multiple feet of debris and then after cleanup. Um, again, the trail washout um, and uh, this uh, we also actually incorporated kind of some habitat improvement as well. So there's uh, uh, some root balls or root wads used in this uh, and uh, just some unique um, design features in that. Um, and uh, some of the contractors were having a great fishing success right after it was finished. So that was good to see. Um, and, and so looking to the future, um, I've been in this position for um, just about eight years, um, and I've dealt with uh, numerous uh, flooding events, um, and they just continue to happen. So the frequency uh, is obviously changing uh, and increasing. So unfortunately, the reality is I think we're going to see more of these events continuing. Um, and so where we could, uh, we did add some additional protections, um, armoring, things like that, where we could uh, on this project to try and help protect our investment uh, into the future. And I think one of the best examples is on the next slide. Um, this is a, a bridge that uh, we did a full replacement. This is the bridge that had uh, that damaged abutment that I showed earlier. Um, and what we did here is we realized that the the uh, freeboard of that previous bridge um, uh, 
wasn't enough. There wasn't enough clearance between um, the typical uh, uh, water elevation uh, or and the uh, 100 year flood stage elevation as well. And so we actually um, designed this, uh, the engineering firm designed this and raised that freeboard. So we had better clearance for future high water events. Um, and so uh, just in conclusion, um, you know, we just, I guess well, I got one more slide, I think. Um, just some of the lessons learned. Uh, others have said it, but communication is vitally important. Uh, and that goes from uh, us as as on the ground staff between us and engineers and FEMA and, and leadership in our program. Um, and, and then just a good reminder that the public is our primary stakeholder and to keep them informed. We had uh, the phones were ringing off the hook pretty much constantly during that several year period, um, asking when the trail was gonna be reopened. Um, Another thing is to expect delays. They're going to happen. Delays in funding, um, delays in design, uh, uh, things like that. Uh, and you have to be flexible and adaptable. Uh, things change. Even on site, um, we, uh, as we started the project, we wound up uncovering another issue. Um, so we had to order some uh, or uh, implement some change orders to the project. Um, but thankfully, we were able to get that work done as well. And then document everything, um, especially for FEMA type disaster declarations. Um, the more documentation, the better. As we continue now several years removed from this event, uh, we can con continue to get questions about some of those things. So having that documentation on hand is very good. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your presentations. That, that was a lot to process, a lot of really good information. The good thing is that these webinars are recorded. The slides will be available. You can always come back. We're going to spend a few minutes on uh, Q&A, uh, just about two minutes. Um, and in the chat, you'll also see what's up coming up in the uh, for our webinar series. So I'm just going to um, ask a rapid fire question because we have two minutes, anybody who feels like jumping in, please do. What is the one skill or tool that is not funding that you wish you had had before the disasters, before these natural events struck? What's one skill or tool that would have been really useful to have um, before these events? I think it would be good to have training in grants.gov so that when you are entering all of this information and you're doing a FEMA declaration and you're trying to get all of your documentation in, when I started, um, it was on paper and we had to turn in binders. And so having training in grants.gov to be able to enter information would be helpful. Nice. Anyone else? Yeah, I think for me, it would just be knowing the process, the FEMA process better. Um, we learned a little bit from each disaster, but now how do we how do we make sure we know that we have that knowledge before the next one hits? Eric, Andy, any thoughts on uh, useful tools or skills? Uh, just kind of as I left off there, um, just having the the proper tools to document and and knowing mm. again, kind of related to what Missy and, mm. and Josh said, uh, knowing what you need to capture and what to document. So uh, again, mm. understanding that process. Tricky thing is, it seems like the FEMA process changes every disaster that we have. Yeah, I, I hope I don't make anybody angry in saying that um, we anticipated seventy five percent cost reimbursement from FEMA, and that number went up to ninety five percent, and then eventually that number went up to one hundred percent, and we aren't 100% sure exactly what happened there, but they just kept saying that the reimbursement, uh, more of the cost is reimbursable. Um, and so we also experienced uncertainty during the process. It was um, in our favor in this case, but uh, that certainly could have gone the other direction and that would have been a much less pleasurable way for that project to end. So um, yeah. yeah, I think uncertainty in what funding will be available based on what costs were incurred uh, makes it very challenging. I will say that um, that did not deter us from uh, carrying out the needed repairs. We were going to find a way to get the project completed, but um, the uncertainty, and it did take, mm -hmm. uh, I think, two and a half years after the final construction before we got final reimbursement completed. I know others have had longer processes, but um, that is yeah. that is certainly the most challenging part is the, the documentation, not the access to funding. Yeah. Well, thank you, guys. Thanks again for making the time to be with us and share your, your insights and your experiences. And thank you to everyone who joined this webinar. We hope we'll catch you at our future events. So keep an eye out for that.
All right. Have a good evening. No, have a good afternoon. Thank <laughs> you.